Today we're going to restore two SVI 328s, look at the differences between these two revisions, and use a different technique to clean the keycaps. Hello and welcome back to Noel's Retro Lab. Today we have two Spectra Video 328s. You may remember it from some previous episodes as the computer held together by hot glue. <laughs> I believe both machines are working, so the goal today is to learn about their differences and clean them. And along the way, we're going to be able to try out a new technique, at least to me, for cleaning the keycaps. So here are both computers. Like we saw in the mail day when I opened both of them, the cases are identical. It's just that the labels are different, and then this one has this big, this is just a sticker. It's not any kind of you know, like plastic badge or anything like that. And um, I was actually wondering what to do with it because there's clearly a lot of dirt. So I'm gonna have to do a good cleaning. And I thought, well, it's just a sticker. Maybe I should remove it. And then I thought, well, maybe I shouldn't. So actually I posted on Twitter and uh, I started getting mixed replies on what people thought I should do. So I actually even put a poll and it looks like the great majority of people are saying, leave it in place. So we'll try to do that. It looks like it's pretty well stuck. So I'm gonna to try to clean the case without affecting that. And you know, if it gets damaged, then I'll remove it. But anyway, other than that, both computers are, as I said, they are identical on the outside. This, they both look very dirty. This has some extra plastic in there, and some sticker left over. And you can even see there's a lot of, oh wow, there's even something there. There's a lot of, a lot of dirt in this keyboard. So this was, this one at least was a very, well-loved SVI 328. Let's see what this is. This looks like a sticker of some kind or at least a piece of paper. <laughs> it's the letter E, okay. I wonder what I wonder what the, the, what the story was in there. That's actually, I wonder a fair amount of the time is what the story is behind some of the computers that I get to restore. Where were they? Do they have some kid playing games? Do they have somebody programming, running accounting with it? Who knows? There's so many possibilities. Was it in a school? Um, so yeah, I don't know what the story is, but this one definitely got a lot of use given the dirt and the general you know, dust and all of that. I should mention before anything else that in this one is the older model. So this is the one, the Mark One or MK1. It wasn't really labeled that way. It was just the SV328. And then later they made this one, which is more of a cost reduced version. And they labeled this as MK2 Mark II. And even, oh right, it says it right there. And even they changed their logo to SVI, which is what you more normally think about. This was still the SV328, but they are the same computer inside. It's not even a RAM upgrade. <laughs> the RAM in both is the same. And for some people wondering, what is up with 80K of RAM? That's actually correct. It's 64 kilobytes of system RAM plus 16 kilobytes of video RAM, which because this is an MSX-like system, it has a separate VRAM from system RAM. So that is correct. And yes, they were very proud of their 32 kilobytes of ROM back then. That meant we have a fancy basic and we have lots of routines and we have lots of things ready for you. There's one more thing that I noticed and that's the Mark I. It's definitely heavier, which is surprising. Yes and no. I mean, it's it's not surprising because this is cost reduced and cost reduces fewer components and usually means lighter. But one of the major differences is that the Mark II changed the video out. So this one had a DIN connector, a kind of proprietary DIN connector for the composite video signal. This one has a regular just you know, TV jack video and audio for composite video signal, but it also has an RF modulator. And in the case of the Mark I, it was an external accessory that it came with it. I'm surprised that this one with the RF modulator is significantly lighter. The thing that I'm thinking about is that maybe this is has a massive RF shield, although if it doesn't have an RF modulator, I guess they still need an RF shield for all the RAM chips and all that to prevent interference. So maybe we'll find like a you know heavy, thick metal shield when we open it. Um, let me check to see if I'm imagining things or what the difference is for real. All right, so the Mark I, 
Can you read it in there? There you go. It says 1643. No, they mark two. Sorry. So the cost reduced. 1643. Yeah. 1970. So it is like 300 grams heavier. That's um, that's definitely significant. Um, now I'm extra curious to see what the difference is inside. So anyway, one of the things I'm very curious about with the earlier model is that I've never seen one inside. So I'm curious what the board is like compared to the Mark II. But in particular, the Mark II was really horrible because it had three subboards and they were they didn't have connectors and they were just glued together with hot glue. <laughs> and that was just the most uncomfortable thing to work on ever. I wonder if they did anything better with Mark I. I'm afraid they didn't, but it's definitely one of the things I'm looking forward to checking out. So let's go ahead and open both of them. I'm going to start with the Mark II because that's the one I'm most familiar with. And then after that, I'll open up the Mark I and see what we find in there. The way the screws were kind of stuck at the very beginning makes me think that either nobody's been here before or at least they haven't been in here for a long, long time. Let's see if that's true or not. Right, okay, so this is still all right. So to open this, this is still the same mess full of hot glue. There you go. This is exactly what I expected there and there. This one at least has the two voltage regulators correctly hooked up to the heat sink in there. That's kind of a cute way of doing that. Oh yeah, and if you look at the, they put those, I don't know, like that paint and I think the paint matches in every screw. Yep, the paint. So this has definitely not been removed from the time it was installed in the factory. Okay, I'm not gonna take it out anymore yet. I'm, I'm gonna open up the other one and compare. This one does not have the same snap on the screws as the other one, so. I suspect this one was definitely opened since it was released in the factory. So we may find some surprises inside. Oh, wow. This board is massive compared to the other one. I had no idea. Wow. Okay. So yeah, the other one just had, this was a small subboard, and then all of that stuff was compressed in an area like this, even with enough room for the heat sinks in there. So the good news is that we only have one connector that is glued in place instead of two of them that will make it, I think, a little more comfortable to work on this. Uh, they love their hot glue, that's for sure. <laughs> Need to make sure that it doesn't go anywhere. So I removed the case from the Mark I, and yeah, it's definitely filthy. I mean, wow, it's greasy too, so it definitely is gonna need a lot of cleaning. And yeah, we can see that underneath here, it has a thick RF shield, which I thought maybe I would get rid of it completely, but it's also serving as a, I guess, protection a little bit on that edge connector, not protection, but to prevent more things from going in. So I may preserve it. I don't mind this so much underneath and yeah, the metal ones are nicer. I can't stand the cardboard ones that just go on top and all they do is <laughs> keep things hotter than they should, but underneath it should be fine. Oh, some interesting markings, a wire there. Oh, multiple wires. Yeah, I don't think this is from the factory, not those wires. I was willing to believe that I noticed there was something weird here, like maybe that is from the factory. Oh, look, another little detail. Somebody put um, electrical tape in here. As I suspected from test from opening the screws, somebody's here, but it seems mostly okay. And I tested it and this one is working. Both of them are working. And so here they are side by side and it's very clear how much they condensed the, the uh, board itself. But of course, to make up for it, they had to add this extra little sideboard. And they had to do that probably because they wanted to use the same case. So they had to have the video output in the same location. Otherwise, maybe they would have made a slightly larger board and have it all together. But anyway, let's have a quick look at both boards and see what the exact differences are. 
Once you look closely at the boards, you'll notice a lot of similarities. The CPUs are right there, the VDP is right there, the AY sound chip is more or less in the same location, and right next to it is the PPI. We have a similar bank of 8 chips for the system RAM, although on the Mark 1, they are a lot more spaced out than on the Mark 2, so they're a lot more comfortable for working on. And the same thing happens with the video RAM. The ROM is the first change. On the Mark 1, we have two 16 kilobyte ROMs, but on the Mark 2, it's combining a single 32 kilobyte ROM. Interestingly, they left room to add an additional ROM on the board, although that's always been unpopulated as far as I know. So far, everything has been pretty much the same. The big change, though, is the introduction of the ULA. The ULA combines all those logic chips and most of those tracks into a single 40-pin IC. That's the main reason they managed to reduce the size of the board so much. For repairs, though, i much rather have the discrete components that are easier to test individually and replace them whenever you need to. So there are actually several really interesting things about this board other than all the chip changes from this one to the next revision. And one of those interesting things is this area over here. This, which may look like a protection for the cartridge, is really a pretty big heat sink. And it's, it's all connected, so it's all helping dissipate that, that heat. And we have two voltage uh, regulators hooked up to it. So we have a 7812, so that generates 12 volts, and that's a 7805, so that's a 5 volt generation. This is a massive heat sink. I suspect this is better than the aluminum one on the second revision. And I'm sure it's part of what adds weight to the whole board. Apart from that, we have the video section, which, as I mentioned before, we have the DIN 5 connection. The cool thing about it is that it's not just a random DIN 5 connection, it's exactly the same pinout as the VIC-20 and the Commodore 64. I doubt that was a coincidence. I suspect they looked at the VIC-20 and said, okay, let's do something similar. Really, it's only two signals that are coming from there, is the composite video and the audio. So it's two out of the five pins and maybe a ground or something. Um, so it's not that uncommon, but it, there happen to be exactly the same one. So you can use the same cable, which is great. The other unusual thing about this board, I thought, was the way these quartz crystals are set up. So they have, so they're not touching the board, and they have like a little spongy thing underneath, which I guess it makes sense because it, it, it will sort, sort of dampen a little bit vibration, and the quartz is actually, it generates the oscillations through a physical vibration, so they could be damaged from just vibrations in general, so that makes sense. But then it's also a good idea to ground the casing of the quartz crystal, and so they have an extra cable soldered in there, which I don't know if this was done this way at the factory or someone did it afterwards. I have a feeling this was afterwards, and it's not just this one, it's like every single one of them is that way. So I thought it was an interesting little detail that I had never quite seen exactly that same way anywhere else. This board for me would be perfect if it wasn't because of this. So I don't have the ADL connector, but I'm going to try desoldering that and using some pin headers. So I will solder those on the board and use a second set of pin headers to solder the ribbon cables directly there and then use that to connect it and disconnect it. It's not going to be the most comfortable thing in the world. I would probably, you know, ideally I would want some kind of plastic connector, kind of like what the Commodore 64 has. That might even be the right number of pins. We need 24 pins, but this will be good enough for now. And um, if I find a better connector down the line, I can always swap it. So I'm going to give that a try. Well, I'm glad I checked this connector before I started desoldering it because I just did a quick check like this. And this is what I was planning on using these, the, this row of pin headers. And if I aligned this side, you can tell that they're not aligned in here properly. So this is clearly not the exact pitch for a connector. These, these pin headers are supposed to be 2.54 millimeters. So I don't know what this is. I don't know. I don't think that's exactly two millimeters. That would be too, too wide for that. Um, but yeah, in any case, I don't think you can actually use this. So I'm going to hold off and I still want to do that connector of some kind because that will make this board ideal to work with and, and everything. So if somebody knows of a good type of connector that would work here with either 23 or 24 pins, definitely let me know. Uh, I'd love to make that change in the future. 
All we have left is give the machines a good clean, and for that I'm going to start with the keys. I'm going to try two different methods with the two different keyboards, so let's start by pulling the keys out first. So they don't have any springs or anything like that. This is all just a plunger in there, so it makes them extra nice to remove. So one thing you need to be careful with is the space bar. I don't know how this keyboard is set up. Sometimes they have little bars. Oh yeah, I, I see a bar in there underneath, so I can't just pull on it. Or if I pull on it, there we go. I need to be careful. There we go. And now... remove that. Oh, and this one had is the only one that had an actual spring. Okay. For these keys, I'm going to use my tried and true method of just one window cleaner and some scrubbing. For the other keyboard, I'm going to use something new and compare the two approaches. Before we even start, the space key has this sticker here and it doesn't come off easily. So I'm going to apply some of these like oil spray that helps soften the glue in things like this. I'll just leave it on the side and we'll come back to it at the end. And then for the rest of the keys, it's like usual. Apply some window cleaner to keep this rag wet and scrub all four sides, or five sides really, of the key. And they're not too dirty, so this should be relatively straightforward. And there we go, another 80 more to go. Let's see if the space key's any better now that has been sitting here with the oil. Oh yeah, look at that. It just comes right off. Yeah, that's a good trick. I used to use alcohol for things like this, but it takes more effort for it to soak in and then the alcohol can damage some of the plastic surfaces. And yeah, this is great. Came off great. And now just clean it with the same product. Perfect. The case itself is not very dirty at all. It just has some dust and I guess, I guess it has some light yellowing and we're not gonna do anything about that today. We just wanna get the grime that is inside the texture. And for that, I'm just gonna use the same window cleaner as before and a brush. So that's pretty good, but there's still a few areas that are kind of dark and you see some dirt in there that didn't come out with the, um, with the cleaner. So I'm going to go to my second go-to um, cleaning tool, which is baking soda and water. And that usually is great for this kind of rugged texture cases. Just dip the rag in some water and just gently rub it over. Yeah, check it out, it all goes away. Look at that, all gone. So while we wait for the other keyboard to dry, let's do this one, but let's do this one in a different way. In the past, when I've shown a video of me cleaning a keyboard like I just did, several of you commented that there's a much better way to clean it, or especially a, a, a lot less work involved, and that is to use, yes, denture tablets. These are the things that you put on um, like dental prosthetics. Um, and supposedly you can take the keys, put them in hot water with a few taps of those and leave them for half an hour. And supposedly they came out really clean. I can't imagine how that is going to remove the grime, but many people have said that and I've even seen it on the internet in different places. So let's give it a try. Why not? And we have a comparison with the other keyboard. Since I bought this from Amazon, I have a feeling that for the next several months, I'm just going to get recommendations for walking canes and hearing aids. So at least I hope that works really well. Okay, let's put some warm water like that. And now let's put several of these. There they go, they're fizzing away. has a minty flavor. I'm not sure I want the keyboard to smell like mint afterwards, but we'll see. Hey, if this works while I can be doing other things, that's great. Oh, I had been warned about this blue color. That's normal. 
that's in general apparently this is very normal they're not going to turn blue this is also not going to do any kind of um, um, retro brighting so there's no as far as i know there's no um, peroxide in there so yeah it should be should be an interesting experiment it's certainly bubbling a lot so okay let's see what happens and while this is going on let's assemble the other keyboard And yep, yeah, that came out really nicely. Okay, it's time to check on the keycaps. I'm going to empty it and rinse it well. So here they are after they had a chance to dry out and I'm impressed. I was not expecting this. They look totally clean. I mean, I can kind of see if you put the light the right way you see a little something, but I think that's just from drying that it didn't, obviously it just let it air dry. But the keys weren't super dirty to start with, but they definitely had not just dust, but they had some um, stuff stuck to them and it's completely gone. And I just have to say it again, I did not scrub the keys at all. I put them there, I rinsed them out and I let them dry. That was it. So. The fact that they look even close to how it is done by hand, it's great because that's half an hour, 20 minutes that I was able to spend doing something else. And really, they they look just as good. And if there was any dirt or grime inside, that also took care of it. Whereas I, I can never really scrub in there when I do it by hand. So this might be my new go-to way of uh, cleaning keys. I'll, I'll have to do a test with something that is really, really, really disgustingly dirty. I'd be very curious to try that. But this first try, this was great. So to all of you who recommended this method, thank you. So here they are back fully assembled. And yeah, the keys with the denture tabs, they look great. They look just as good as the keys that I spent 20 minutes scrubbing. So that was, that was a great trick. One interesting little bit, and maybe it's just interesting to me and to a few other people interested in fonts, is that the fonts in the two keyboards are not exactly the same. Or maybe they are the same, and this is just a little bolder. So the keys in the Mark I, they seem to have bolder text in them, and these are lighter. Interesting choice, and I'm not sure why. I actually like the bolder ones a little bit better. That just makes it more clear. But uh, it's a very, very minor change. So let's turn both computers on right now. I want to check if they have the same ROM, at least from the message that it prints at a startup. And then I'm curious to see if there's any kind of image quality difference. I don't expect it to be, but since the video connectors are different and potentially maybe some of the video circuit might be a little different, I'm just curious to see if we notice anything right away. So this is the Mark I computer, and yeah, I mean, it looks really good. And now let's connect the Mark II and see if there's any difference. I don't really see anything obviously different other than this one doesn't say how much memory there is left. Here, I'm gonna put them side by side. So they both seem to have the same version of basic 1.1, but the Mark one for some reason shows how many bytes they are freeze and they remove that in Mark two. Other than that, the image quality, it's very, very similar. The Mark two one seems brighter. That's surprising because the settings on the TV and the camera were exactly the same. I actually like the quality of the Mark one a little bit better, but I suspect that you can just adjust the brightness on the TV and get the same effect. So yeah, they pretty much look identical. And there you have it. More than you ever wanted to know about the differences between the two versions of the SVI 328. Which one do I personally recommend? They're pretty much identical. So I'd say that either one is perfectly fine. I have a small preference for the Mark one because the longer board and the discrete components and the video connector but I'd be totally happy with the Mark II as well. I wanted to load some games to test them out, but we're out of time. However, I will have two more videos about this. One of them is going to be restoring and fixing this SVI cassette player with an interesting color paint. 
And the other one is going to be testing out this SVI CAS, which is like a TCX Arduino for many different systems, but with connectors specific to the SVI, like this one over here. And all of that is going to be coming up in the next couple of weeks. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Leave me any comments below as usual, and I will see you next time. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Noel's Retro Lab on Patreon or joining the membership on YouTube. Not only is that the best way to support this channel and allow me to continue making more videos, but you also get some extra perks like early access, ad-free videos, and more. Thank you again to all the supporters. See you next time.